our study this morning. Um, not going to get too far into it, so uh, surprise is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The title of our study this morning is God is Faithful by Whom You Were Called. So I just want to read our scriptures, and then I'm going to drop back and we'll discuss a few things. So verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sophonies, our brother. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you came short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. So as Paul penned this letter to the church at Corinth, this church was in the midst of a pagan society. This church was in the midst of a society that uh, a lot of the commerce as it went from east to west, in and out of the city, it was, it was various thoughts, various ethnicities, various people groups, and there was a great uh, Inpouring in the city and, and outgoing of the city. And so in that, the church was in a place that I think could be described as similar to where we are today. You know, Paul penned this letter because of the issues that were going on within the church in response to two letters that he received while he was in Ephesus concerning the church. And in penning this letter, and penning these letters as we, we go further into uh, 2 Corinthians down the road, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Tom Pendon, I don't know if any of you know him, he used to attend fellowship here, uh, he posted something on FaceSpace, or, or one of those uh, social media sites, and, and I read it, and I thought, man, what insight, it's absolutely the truth. He goes, you know what, if Paul lived in this day and age, he'd be sending some letters to the churches, right? I mean, if he lived in this day and age, we'd be getting letters from Paul. And so I think the message in 1 Corinthians is timely. I think the message in 1 Corinthians is uh, absolutely necessary for us to hear as, as a people group. There's so much that's going on within the church that is saved. I'm not talking about the aspect of the church that thinks they know uh, God through Jesus Christ, they have no clue who Jesus Christ is, no relationship. I'm, I'm talking about those who are absolutely saved by the blood of the Lamb. There is so much going on, and we're going to address that um, uh, maybe this morning, maybe a couple weeks from now, but uh, sectarianism, the whole aspect of us not being one in Christ, but having multiple distractions in our lives. And I'm not talking about outside of fellowship. I'm not talking about the things that are apart from the fellowship. I'm talking about fellowships that are, that are way distracted by way more many things than they need to be distracted by. Their focus is not on Jesus Christ. Their focus is on men that are outside of the church. Their focus is on perhaps um, um, flags, if you will. Um, their focus is on um, all kinds of things. And as Paul is going to address those things, as he addresses sectarianism, we need to be careful as a body of Christ. We're here to learn Jesus Christ. And then make application of that as we go out into the community. And you can do that however you believe the Lord leads you, right? But we're not in here to part and parcel social mores. We're not here to talk about the um, 
the, the medical aspects of should we or should we not. We're not here to advocate for uh, one political um, excitement versus the other political excitement. We're not here to do that. We're here to learn of Jesus and, and him alone. And so is, is Paul <clears throat> in this letter to the church at Corinth? Let me read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Scripture says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul was about, Jesus Christ and him crucified. For apart from that, you have nothing as far as eternal life. If you don't know Christ and Christ crucified, if he isn't your Lord and Savior, if he isn't, hasn't been the propitiation for your sins, you've got nothing but eternal death on the other side of eternity. So as Paul continues in verse 3, he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Nobody needs another man's opinion. I'm telling you, there is no original opinion that has ever existed. Somebody's already said it. Somebody's already formulated it. Somebody's always already expressed it one way or another. What we need to, to understand, it's the wisdom of God, not the opinions of men. Verse 6, however we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God, the mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Are you confused? Do you sit there and you try and figure out what is going on, but yet you don't ask the Spirit? Hey, illuminate your word. Tell me what I need to do. Take these prayers that I, I'm babbling and make them of, of meaning. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Verse 12, now we have received. So pay attention, church. Speak to us. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that we have been freely given or that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For he has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So for us is the redeemed, us is the saved, us is the called in Christ. We are a special lot. And, and at times we forget that. We are a special bunch of people because God set his love upon us through his son, Jesus Christ. God reconciled us to him through his son, Jesus Christ. 
And then doing the reconciling and having first loved us prior to us loving him, then accepting that through the death and the resurrection of, of his son, Jesus Christ. We now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which assures us that we are his children. And in that, there's nothing more incredible. Sexual immorality, abuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, dragging each other into court, following the ways of the world. These were all things that prompted the Apostle Paul to write this epistle to the Corinthians. He wrote this epistle not to be the, the guy with the big stick. Was it Churchill who said, speak softly to carry a big stick? He wasn't a big stick kind of a guy. Paul was a guy who just, he spoke what the Spirit led him to speak, what God led him to speak. He let the chips fall where they may, and in doing so, he spoke with love. He, he spoke with understanding of what the church was in the middle of and what they needed to hear. We're told quite clearly in Scripture, and this is one thing that I have to keep in, in, in my mind. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall what? Have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. If, if you had a fireplace, I don't know if you do or you don't. If you had a mantle over your fireplace, which you might have and might not, what would be on your mantle of light? What would you place up there and perhaps venerate in place of God? I know early in my Christianity, and there's probably things now that um, aren't coming to mind or things that have yet to be revealed. But one of the things that I placed at times above God was our children. We lived out in the middle of nowhere, and out in the middle of nowhere, our kids, when uh, they went places with friends, went from the middle of nowhere to the middle of somewhere, but we were still stuck in the middle of nowhere with our kids out in somewhere. And then when our kids got old enough to drive, remember those moments, Janet? Those were exciting moments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of our kids, whether they had licenses or not, they, when we would leave sometimes, one of our sons, I won't mention his name, Bruce, um, <laughs> would, um, would take the license plate off of whatever car remained and place it on his old clunker, and I think it was like 13, 14, and go driving around town. And remember, he had to get from the middle of nowhere to the middle of somewhere. So, but, but in that, in those early days with our children, I, I didn't trust God with our kids. I was so concerned. I was so fearful of them going on, you know, Rancho Road, two lane, you know, all the way into town, coming back and everything. And I, and I really lived in fear until I realized that I had placed our children before my Lord. I had to rearrange my theology. And so, in the midst of what Paul is going to do within the church of Corinth, he's going to seek to get their priority, their priorities in order. Read out of Jeremiah 25, verses 6 through 7. Scripture further tells us, Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. But you have, yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hand to your own hurt. Listen to that. The works of your hand, the things that you do apart from me, you're doing to your own hurt. For those of us who are heads of our household, and I don't mean that in a lorded over those who um, are in your household manner, I mean that in a positional called to be head of the household manner, have you ever thought about your actions as being harmful and hurtful to those that are within your household? Have you ever thought about the things that you say, the things that you do, the actions that you portray within the home and outside of the home as not being for the good of those who are within the home with you? And, and we have to think about that. My wife is my completer, is my better half. Um, is called to the ministry alongside with me. I couldn't do anything <clears throat> without you. But she has a responsibility too, as do the rest of you in here who perhaps aren't heads of household in that sense. But you have responsibility. 
you have a responsibility to say something. You have a responsibility to take actions. And I want to make a confession. Earlier this week, we were sitting down and watching one of the new TV shows that we had watched in the past. And it, then it delved into a, a, a topic that was, where did that come from? <clears throat> and I probably stayed a minute or two longer on that TV show than I should have. Well, it, it wasn't good. You know, I don't know what, not, you know, I have no excuse. I shouldn't have done that. And I looked at Janet and I said, yeah, we're, we're going elsewhere. And so we turned on a, another program and uh, never returned to that program. But we gotta watch, we gotta be sensitive. We gotta be instant. Instant, like going to the doctor when they do your reflexes on your knee. I mean, for those of us who still have reflexes, <laughs> you get hit and it jumps. I mean, if something hits you in life and you jump, get away from it. Do not have any other thing before the Lord. So Paul more than likely wrote this letter from Ephesus during his third missionary journey. And uh, it was during a three-year stay at Ephesus. And it's amazing that the commercial success that the Corinthians uh, were able to partake in also led to the moral debauchery that was present in the city. It seems like sometimes the more successful you are in life, the more you're able to take and go out and dabble in things that uh, when you weren't so successful, you weren't able to do. When your mindset was on survival mode, um, you were able to focus, you were able to do those things that you perhaps ought to do, and not saying you're sinless at that point or perfect, just you didn't have the, you know, the extra ability to go out and, and dabble. Well, within this church, they had that ability to go out and dabble, or not within the church, within the society, because they were very successful, very profitable, and in that, um, that generally leads to uh, a moral decadence which they they distributed or they they resembled. Yet in the midst of all that was wrong in Corinth, God placed a church there. The Lord raised up a people there that they could be what? A beacon of light, a beacon of hope, that they could go forward into the midst of a society full of darkness, be tried by that very darkness yet come forth as refined as gold, right? And, and that's kind of what we're in the middle of. Reading out of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall separate us from the love of God? Let me read the scriptures. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reading one of the two letters that was sent to Paul, which prompted, I believe, this letter to the church of Corinth. I want to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. 
Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. At least anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, least the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. See, Paul's getting to the crux of why these letters were written. The second um, letter that he received concerned the taking of a brother to court, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 11. There are any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world and that the world will be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Verse four, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do not appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge. I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already another failure for you that you go to the law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor uh, idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's a hard one, huh? Litigious people in the midst of a litigious society. And it's hard not to, at times, think that our only justice will be brought forward in the court of men. But this is what I believe the Lord would have us to do. We need to seek him before we seek an attorney. We need to seek him before we seek an audience with a judge. We need to go and if we're in the midst of some excitement with a brother or sister or a Christian organization, then we need to go and as we seek him, we need to seek to come together with those entities. And we seek to take and put the things of others higher than our own. And that is tough. That is absolutely tough at times. I'm here to tell you by personal experience, that is not the easiest nut to crack in the world. But just because it's not the easiest doesn't mean that we're not called to do it, right? And so in that, back to the letters that, that Paul received, back to the purpose of what, um, what Paul is doing here with, within the letters to this church at Corinth. In the, in the weeks ahead, it's, it's going to, I think, become very obvious to us where the issues are, what the problems are. And, um, and let me read some scripture as the worship team comes up. And this is where we're going to close for today. And once again, next week will be a Palm Sunday a message following uh, Sunday. Is Easter Sunday, so obviously Easter message. But let me read what um, what is said in Luke chapter six, verses forty-six through forty-nine. This is Jesus speaking. He says, "Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say?" So I'm going to repeat that one more time. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose 
the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. I'm going to stop there for a moment. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Continuing verse 49 of Luke chapter 6, Jesus speaking. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So two different examples of how and where to build a foundation. Remember years ago when I was out uh, in the desert doing construction uh, safety inspections, so not building safety, but uh, the workers and, and just trying to keep them safe and uh, obeying the uh, OSHA laws. I was amazed because I had never been around sites that um, built structures on sand. I mean, out here, we either had the dynamite things when I was building or, you know, I mean, it, it expansive soil you had to take out and put back in it. But I had never been around sandy soil, uh, at least building wise anyway. And, and so I marveled at, at, as they pulled the sand out for uh, footings, the sides would fall back in. And so they'd go a little wider and pull it out. Pretty soon they have these, these trenches, but but yet they're massive in width, but, but yet what they hold was, was like normal, you know, footings. And I always thought, how do you build on something so slippery a slope? How do you take, and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I guess they just pour it all in, get it on top, and it's kind of one of those floating, wherever it goes programs, you know, obviously it didn't work that way, but um, for us, we need to make sure that the only foundation we build upon is the foundation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Everything else is sinking sand. Everything else is slipping sand. 